and other organizations, citizen scientists, can contribute to improving how we integrate uh, invasive species information with time series and remote sensing approaches. So our introduction to Landsat remote sensing. Uh, first Landsat satellite was launched in 1972 and we've had continuous coverage ever since. Uh, there's currently two Landsats in operation, Landsat 7 and Landsat 8, um, and these sensors are a critical part of our Earth observing systems. Landsat has a spatial resolution of 30 meters, which means that we aren't able to see things like individual tree crowns or houses. What we get is an average reflectance over a 30 by 30 meter square. So if we look at these two pictures, uh, they're looking at the exact same area. In the high-res image, we can see all the houses, roads, trees. Uh, in the Landsat image, we get kind of a blurrier green blob. But while Landsat may have a coarser spatial resolution, uh, it has the advantage of having seven different spectral bands, um, up to 10 bands on the newer sensors, which means that the sensor can see beyond what the human eye can see. So we're able to measure reflectance in the red, green, and blue, the visible portion of the spectrum, as well as the near-infrared, shortwave infrared, and thermal infrared, which gives us more robust information on different land cover types and surface properties. And in the temporal domain, we're able to acquire a Landsat image every 16 days if we have one sensor in operation, or every eight days if we have two. So this little movie that I'm hoping everyone's seeing right now is showing what uh, Landsat data looks like for kind of a small chunk of landscape in Massachusetts. You'll see that we got lots of different looks through the seasons. Um, sometimes clouds get in the way, so clouds are a big problem with optical sensors, um, but we can really see that temporal uh, progress in seasonal and vegetation characteristics. And so what's interesting about the temporal domain is that prior to 2008, uh, Landsat imagery was pay-per-use. So each image would cost uh, anywhere from hundreds to thousands of dollars to be downloaded and used. But in 2008, the USGS changed its data distribution policy uh, and made all available Landsat imagery uh, free for public download. And so since the opening of the archive, as the lower plot shows, we've seen a skyrocketing use of Landsat imagery in all sorts of different applications. And what the opening of the archive has allowed is us to make use of every good Landsat observation for individual pixels. And so what I mean by that is we can essentially pull for one 30 meter by 30 meter square every observation that's not obstructed by a cloud, shadow, or snow, and look at it as a time series. And so what I'm showing on this slide is three different time series for the same pixel. Uh, they're just in three different kind of spectral transformations. So the top panel is a uh, Brightness, which is akin to kind of overall albedo or how bright the surface is. The middle panel is showing us greenness over time, uh, and the lower panel is showing what's called wetness, but is really more a measure of vegetation, moisture, and structure. And in this example, we're seeing a conifer area uh, that's been cleared to create some early successional habitat. What I really wanted to show is First of all, what all observations, there's upwards of um, 300, I believe, in these time series look like. You can see uh, the seasonal variability, so the different colors of the points correspond to the different uh, northern hemisphere seasons. So we get both the seasonal variability as well as the long-term trajectory. And to make that point that the sensor is able to see in kind of different views, different spectral bands of the same place. And so this talk is really going to be about how we're using these Landsat time series to improve invasive species mapping and monitoring. And so starting with mapping invasive plant distributions, um, there's a few different ways that we could think about how remote sensing could be used to detect invasive plants. Um, one of the most interesting, what we're really focused on, is using unique phenologies. So we know that invasive species may have earlier green up or an extended growing season. So can we use that seasonal property of the time series to start looking at where phenology differs in space? Um, other approaches may be to look at fluctuating cover. So if you've got annuals invading a perennial system, you would expect to see different spectral patterns, uh, temporal patterns. 
as well as different patterns of growth. So dense stands and different functional types are going to look different to the remote sensing instruments. Um, again, our focus for this talk is really going to be on how we're looking at unique phenologies, but those other approaches are of interest to us in the future as well. So from a phenological perspective, uh, we can use the full record of Landsat observations for a pixel to construct a long-term phenological curve. And so what we're looking at here is that measure of vegetation greenness, tussock cup greenness, uh, plotted all observations for 30 years based on their day of year. So the colors of the points correspond to the years, and we're looking at all of those years on that same seasonal axis. And this is an example for a deciduous hardwood forest, again, in New England. Um, and you can see pretty clearly the shape of that curve. Now, I have the benefit of working with some great people who have developed some amazing algorithms for extracting information from time series, um, and an algorithm developed at BU by Eli Malas and Mark Friedel uh, can be used to translate that curve into a few key dates. And so we're able to extract with their algorithm a start of season, so that dotted blue line, the approximate date of the spring transition, um, a day of year of peak greenness, so at what point in the season does the curve kind of reach its maximum value, that's the green line, and then the end of season, the red dotted line, which is the kind of autumn transition. And so we're able to use these dates, hopefully to distinguish between uh, invasives with different phenologies from more native vegetation. And just to show you how these look in space, so that example was for one pixel. Uh, this map is actually showing the long-term date, so those same values, the end of season, start of season, and peak greenness, uh, mapped for southern New England. And what I really wanted you to take away from this slide is that there's just a lot of variability. We can see that phenology is uh, varying spatially as well as temporally over these larger areas. Uh, and so some preliminary work we've done with those values, uh, we were able to use a data set from the Forest Service, a map of forest species by basal area, and when we extract the start of season dates, which is the lower panel, and the end of season dates for kind of a large sample of each of these species, pixels for each of these species, and we plot them, uh, we start to see some interesting patterns and some evidence that non-natives really do have this distinct phenological signal. And I'd really like to draw your attention to number 21 here, which is Alanthus. Um, the start of season date, you'll see that box is much lower than most of the other boxes, um, and that's an indicator of what we would expect. We know Oanthus greens up before most other canopy species, and here's some evidence that we can really see that signal. Other invasives on this plot, number 21 is Norway maple, also as an earlier start of season. I should mention that that horizontal line running across at about day of year 135 is the mean for all of the different species. So we can see that both Norway maple and Olanthus are uh, earlier than the mean time for all the species represented, although Olanthus is quite a bit sooner. Um, we can also see um, number Right here. Number 59 is black locust, so another invasive. That one's not quite as dramatic, but again, we can start to use that phenological in, uh, information to try and decipher where we might have invasive species based on these phenology patterns. And so that's for kind of canopy species for invasive trees. Um, our next step in our analysis is actually to start applying some of these uh, data sets for looking for understory invaders. So in the little schematic down at the bottom, you can see we would expect when we have an invasive understory that we'll likely see a earlier start of green up and perhaps a later autumn senescence for species, for places that are invaded by species like honeysuckle, garlic mustard, buckthorn. And so we're hoping to start to use the phenology time series to potentially map places that are experiencing these earlier green ups and then look in the field to see uh, what's actually on the ground and if we do have invasives. So that's the piece on mapping invasive plants. We're also able to use time series approaches to monitor invasive insect outbreaks. And so um, this, 
uh, typically invasive insects and pathogens are known as a very widespread uh, agent of change. So uh, back in 2001, it was reported that there was greater than 20 million average annual impacted hectares of forests by insects and pathogens, and this costs upwards of one and a half billion dollars uh, to manage. So obviously invasive insects and pathogens, an important thing to be able to monitor. Typically, however, uh, insect outbreaks and pathogen die-off is monitored using aerial survey techniques. So people are literally sitting in a plane sketching the areas of damage. And while this is able to give us broad-scale survey data, um, the resolution of the data is, is quite coarse. The polygons are very large and broad, um, and the area estimates that we get from them, they tend to overestimate area. It's very costly and labor-intensive to do monitoring in this way. Also only gives us one snapshot per season. So what we're trying to do with the time series approaches is come up with new ways to monitor defoliation or other insect-related damages in near real time. And so a lot of this work came about uh, following the gypsy moth outbreak that we saw in southern New England this past summer. So the summer of 2016 was perhaps the worst just gypsy moth outbreak since 1981 in southern New England, and we saw huge areas of defoliation. So having the Landsat time series for these areas, we developed a new approach to monitoring for defoliation. What we're doing is we're essentially taking a time series for each pixel, so you're looking at one time series, again, of that vegetation greenness measure. Um, the green points are summer observations, yellow points are fall, uh, and the blue tones are spring and winter. Um, and what we do is we fit a model. I won't get too into the technical details on this, but we're able to fit a harmonic model to all of the observations in a given period. We've chosen this 10-year period from 2005 to 2015. We fit a model to essentially get a baseline of what the conditions for that one pixel should look like. And then we're able to use that model to predict what we would expect the conditions to look like uh, in the following year. So in this case, we are predicting what images should look like in 2016. And if you look at the lower panel, we can see that those 2016 points are far off of the curve. So all of those green points kind of in the middle of the plot um, were the observed data, and we're able to compare them to where the red dotted line is, the predicted data, and come up with a metric of difference. So in this case, we're able to subtract our observed data and our predicted data. We normalize it by some model error term, and we come up with this measure of condition. And what's cool about this is that we're able to not just get that one-time snapshot that you would get with an aerial photo, but rather we're able to get an estimate of potential damage every time we get an observation. So on this plot, we're seeing six different points in time. Um, the number of points we're able to assess at is going to depend on the number of images that we have, or at least the number of cloud-free pixels we have. And so to show you what that looks like for our kind of southern New England study area, here we're looking at two different Landsat scenes. So those are the two larger boxes. Um, the colors are showing us the number of observations per pixel, and a lot of the variability is um, the areas that do or don't overlap. So between the two scenes, we have this overlap zone that's the brightest whites in there, and uh, those places we end up with double the number of observations since we get two looks um, as the satellite kind of overlaps itself in its path of acquisition. Um, on the kind of right and left, we have a bit fewer observations, somewhere usually between 8 and 10, but in any case, we're able to get definitely more than one assessment per season. Now, those kind of real-time assessments where we're looking at each snapshot as it comes in would be very useful for um, real-time monitoring, sending people out into the field to verify whether defoliation is happening. But at the end of the season, we also have begun producing uh, these cumulative kind of indices of damage. And so in this map, I'm showing the essentially those deviations from the predicted curve. And we're not just looking at one date, we're looking at the average deviation for each pixel over the course of the entire 2016 growing season. 
And here we can see some clear patterns of gypsy moth defoliation. Uh, those red areas are places that have very high deviations, kind of sustained differences from uh, the predicted curves. And uh, we also gradiate into kind of lower magnitude changes in the yellows, and then places shown in blue. Uh, the brighter blue are forests that don't seem to deviate very much, and then we've masked out all the non-forests in that darker blue. And so you can see from this map that we got a really nice estimate of uh, the spatial degree, this, a spatial view of the degree of change in condition for this very large area. And to kind of zoom in a bit and show you really how fine the detail is, uh, here we've got the same color scheme for the condition metric, but what I'm overlaying in the black outlines and crosshatching there is actually the aerial survey data. And so what you'll notice is those large patchy polygons, we're actually at the Massachusetts-Rhode Island border here, so we can see that each state actually has its own approach to how they map defoliation. Uh, Massachusetts using these, these polygon shapes while Rhode Island in this area uses a grid. And it's clear that there's not perfect agreement between what's coming out of the remote sensing data and what's coming out of the aerial data. There are portions of the aerial polygons that are not defoliated, or at least not showing up as defoliated in the remote sensing data. And then there's uh, you know, large areas that are showing up in red tones in the remote sensing data that don't seem to be captured in the aerial data. So two very different methods at getting a condition map. However, using the remote sensing is advantageous because, again, it's giving us multiple chances to assess damage over the course of a season, um, and it's also giving us a magnitude of impact. It's not just whether or not something has been defoliated, it's giving us the gradient of values. So we're getting a really fine view of uh, both the magnitude and extent of insect defoliator damage. And so kind of zooming out a bit here, we envision using these time series approaches to eventually establish some sort of forest disturbance monitoring system. So we have kind of three steps to the process, as my previous slide showed. We're able to fit our model to some sort of stable base period, which is giving us a stable point of comparison that we can use to compare what we would expect uh, the land surface to look like versus what it actually looks like when we get a new image. By comparing new images to predicted images, we're able to identify those potential changes in condition during sort of monitoring phase. And each time we get a new image, we can output a product to show potential areas of defoliation. Again, that could be used to target field or aerial surveys and to attribute what we're seeing in a remote sensing image to actual uh, pests on the ground. And then finally, we do this assessment phase, which is the last maps that I showed, where we're able to take all of our assessments over the course of a season, the things we've been doing in near real time, and put them into a annual summary metric of disturbance over a large area. And again, I showed this for just two Landsat scenes, but there's potential to do this over a much, much larger area of Landsat coverage. Um, we can do huge swaths of land uh, very quickly and efficiently from this remote sensing perspective. Another piece of this puzzle uh, is also the assessment of risk from defoliators. So in an un, a tangentially related project, we've also been working on using time series derived metrics to improve mapping of forest composition. So what I'm showing here is a map of uh, the potential distribution of central hardwoods, which is the oak hickory dominated communities in western Massachusetts. And those white areas are places where uh, we expect there to be a very high likelihood of an oak dominated community. And in the case of gypsy moths, oaks are one of the highly preferred host species. And so we would expect that these areas in white would be more susceptible to damage. So we're hoping to eventually incorporate not just looking for uh, deviations from our kind of modeled results, but also incorporating the risk of um, which canopy species or which host species are on the ground, all derived from these same Landsat time series data sets, just using different algorithms and approaches to assess them. And so those are my two key applications. However, as uh, 
a manager, as a citizen, as an institution, time series analysis is very computationally intensive, requires a lot of storage space to house all the imagery. So this is not necessarily something that we expect um, every organization or institution to be able to implement themselves. Uh, there's definitely a role for having a remote sensing expert on board to handle all the heavy lifting and processing. But what managers and citizen scientists can really help with uh, is data collection. And so whenever possible, it's a big take home message here, field data collection should be considering the scale of remote sensing observations, which would allow us to start moving from kind of early detection of species, which is kind of the current objective of many mapping efforts, to actually improving how we model species. And so one of the biggest problems right now is being able to relate uh, what's typically collected as point observations to these big squares uh, corresponding to remote sensing pixels. And so in this last section, I'd like to offer some guidance on how uh, we might improve the type of data that's collected and improve how it could be integrated with remote sensing data sets. So our good scenario, it's great to have data. So if you're collecting point data, you're out there with your apps um, mapping where you're seeing species, um, that's great. So presence data is really useful for early detection and rapid response. It helps us know where species are showing up, where they're spreading on the landscape, and we can start to look at kind of basic patterns of invasion. However, presence data gives us a somewhat incomplete picture. So whenever possible, if you're collecting data, uh, scientists, especially those working with remote sensing, prefer abundance over simple presence data. Abundance data is also good for early detection and rapid response. It's helpful to know whether you've got one plant in an area or 100. Um, it's also useful for invasive pattern monitoring, um, just like the presence data, but giving us more robust information on the number of individuals. And this data, most importantly, is more useful for species distribution modeling. With abundance data, we can make much more reliable models of species distribution at the uh, point level. Also want to mention that it's important to have absence data in these data sets. So most of the time we're looking strictly at presence and abundance, uh, but it's very useful to record places where we're not seeing species, just as it's important to record where we are seeing them. So those point level data sets are good and better, but really the best uh, type of data for integrating with remote sensing analysis is going to be area-based metrics that give us a picture of density. So those density metrics are good for all the same things as the point data, but in this case we can actually directly scale our point or our, our uh, on-the-ground observations to remote sensing pixels. And what we're recommending as the kind of way forward for collecting these density metrics is using uh, measures of percent cover and or stem counts. And so what would this look like? Well, in terms of cover estimates, uh, we've got a little table up on the top showing both quantitative and qualitative ways to look at this. So in terms of quantitative cover, we may put some percentage on that. So based on the EDMAPS database, we've kind of come up with these four recommended categories, less than 1% cover being a trace amount, 1 to 5% being a low amount of invasion, 5 to 25% being moderate, greater than 25% being high. And um, while we've got both the quantitative and qualitative scales shown here, those quantitative numbers are a lot more useful. So when I say high in terms of qualitative cover, it's really hard to back out a number, impossible to back out a number, where if you give us uh, in your reporting a quantitative percent cover, we can then relate that into some sort of qualitative binning. Uh, the same goes for a stem count, so stem counts, whether there's one, uh, whether there's 11 to 100, might be few or uncommon, greater than 1,000 being many common, uh, again, varying maybe by species, 100 stems of garlic mustard is going to look very different than 100 stems of Norway maple, but a key point to all of this is also the critical need to report the area unit. So if you're going to give us a quantitative percent cover, we need to know 
what that cover is relative to. And so just to reiterate, this is kind of a big take home message for how we can improve uh, invasive species monitoring using remote sensing, that we need these area-based cover or stem count estimates that allow us to really scale from the plot measurements to pixels. And so if you're wondering maybe what this looks like or how one might go about better designing a study to incorporate these, got a nice little figure here. Uh, 2014 paper by Bethany Bradley, which shows kind of a nested scale of plots. So all the way on the left there, we've got a MODIS-sized uh, box. So MODIS is another optical remote sensor. It has a coarser pixel scale than Landsat at 250 meters. So that big box represents the approximate scale of a MODIS pixel. Within that, you could have plots uh, that are at the Landsat size, so about 30 meters. And then within each of those 30 meter plots, you may actually be collecting maybe one meter sample plots. Now, this is just a suggestion. There's also ways to actually lay out your plots. So if you just wanted to have 30 meter plots and estimate percent cover relative to 30 meters, it would be another option. But uh, this is just to give a sense of what this might look like in an actual plot design. And so coming to the end here, um, giving a really quick overview of the many ways that we can use remote sensing to detect invasive plants and forest pest damage. I highly recommend if you're interested in some of the things that I presented today uh, to look at these papers by Bethany Bradley on invasive plants and Ron Hall um, on pest damage, although this paper particularly as a Canadian perspective, it covers a lot of the pests that are common to North America uh, in general. And you'll be able to get from those descriptions of other ways we could be looking at specific species, other sensors that are out there for um, doing this sort of monitoring, and many more applications. Also, a little plug for uh, my recent paper in Remote Sensing and Ecology and Conservation, which if you're specifically interested in Landsat time series, I give a lot of different examples of all the different ways, not just invasives, that time series could be used uh, to look at ecosystem dynamics. Additionally, we've recently started a group at the Northeast Climate Science Center, the Northeast Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change or Risk Management Project. Um, this is an up-and-coming project, and we're looking to connect managers and scientists around this topic of uh, responses to climate change kind of in the invasive species context. We've got a listserv up and running, so if you'd be interested in getting our news updates and hearing more about what we've got going on, as well as getting lots of great papers and resources, uh, you can contact Carrie Brown Lima, and her email is up there in blue. Um, and she'll be able to add you to the listserv. Also want to make everyone aware that we'll be having our first annual symposium at UMass Amherst uh, in late July. And so again, if you're interested in attending, you can get more information from the listserv. Um, and the dates are up there. You can put them on your calendar. And finally, um, obviously very interested in spatial data on invasive species. So if you have unarchived data, and what I mean by that is data that you may not have yet uploaded to some sort of archiving service or app-based database service, um, if you've got other data sitting around there for your sanctuary, your land, your property, we'd love to hear about it. So the email's up there. You can contact me. My email is valpasq, umass.edu, uh, or Bethany Bradley. Uh, who's my postdoc advisor at UMass, um, and let us know about your data set. We'd love to work with you to incorporate it into all the different data that we're housing on invasive species. And so with that, I've moved very quickly through these, but I can definitely take questions. We're going to have plenty of time. Um, and yeah, thank you everyone for tuning in. Hey, Valerie, it's Liz. 
I do have one question so Hi. far. Um, how do you compensate for Landsat 7 SLC failure in your long-term time series? Uh, that's a great question. Um, so the Landsat 7 SLC failure has been a huge problem. For those who are not familiar, uh, Landsat 7 data has these big gaps in it. There are stripes uh, where we had a mechanical failure on the instrument that prevents us from collecting observations for every pixel in a given image. And so what's really nice about taking the time series based approaches is that rather than using good scenes or good images the way would have been done uh, before the opening of the archive, we're using every good observation for an individual pixel. And so when you have a scan line gap, we may not get an observation for some pixels, but where we do have data, we're able to incorporate them into the time series analysis. Um, in the context of the invasive species monitoring, uh, or sorry, invasive insect monitoring, when we get those snapshots, you're still going to see data gaps in the, the predicted to observed comparison. If the gaps are in the observed data, uh, they're going to show up in that kind of one day snapshot. But when we start to do those season integrated averages, uh, we're able to kind of smooth out across all the good observations for each pixel, and it really helps us overcome those scan line failure challenges. Okay, next question. How do you separate climate disruption and invasives presence as the forcing behind earlier or later greenness? Ah, so that's actually been a big, um, a big question that we've been tackling with this research. And so we know that the phenological signal is a combination of both climate, elevation, and topography, which is also tied to climate. It has to do with the uh, canopy species composition, as well as what's potentially in the understory. And so what we've been trying to do is assemble data sets that allow us to account for all of that. So when we're looking at these phenological signals, um, we're going to be trying to model what phenology should look like for a given forest composition at a given elevation with a given kind of background climate signature. And then we expect that what's going to be left over would be potential deviation from, say, the understory species. Sorry. Uh, do you have any thoughts on how NEON observations might complement your work, N-E-O-N? Ah, that's a really good question. So I'm definitely aware of the NEON program. I'm not quite sure what type of um, data they might lend to this. I don't know if the question asker has any elaborations, if it's more on the species composition side, or are we talking about climate information? But that could definitely be a source of, of some component of this very complicated process. Is it possible for any user to download the pixel level data from any Landsat data? Currently, we are downloading in path row format. Huh, again, very good question. So um, to get a pixel level time series, you need a lot of, of imagery. We use a lot of computational power to do the analysis that we're doing. So in the current data format, everything is still being served as path row images, which sounds like people know they're able to download. However, moving forward, USGS is uh, in the process of releasing or kind of implementing, I guess I should say, a new data format that'll be much more tuned to these kind of pixel level analysis where they're going to be uh, creating data tiles instead of path rows. And so you'll be able to get little chunk, littler chunks of images and it'll be easier to get the images through time. That said, it's still a lot of uh, processing and uh, data management in order to do this analysis. So I imagine that while um, well, interest is going to continue to grow, that there'll be other solutions to how users might get access to the data. For example, the Amazon-based cloud services are very interested in hosting time series type uh, data sets, as well as uh, the Google Earth Engine. So Google Earth Engine has already ingested all of the Landsat archive. They have surface reflectance products uh, readily available. And so if you're looking to do more simple kind of time series analysis, that would be another option. But again, I guess 
to summarize, the raw data that you're getting as images is still path rows, not integrated across pixels. We hope to see more pixel level time series friendly data in the near future from USGS and then in the meanwhile users could start exploring some of these options where they may not necessarily have to download the data themselves but they can conduct analysis with cloud-based uh, tools like Google Earth Engine and the Amazon Web Service. Can your models be used in tropical regions or is seasonality a fundamental requirement? Great question. Um, yeah, so a lot of uh, the lab that I worked with on B, at BU on a lot of the time series analysis does do a lot of work in the tropics. So our models are harmonic models, so we're able to account for seasonality and some tropical systems, my understanding, do exhibit some degree, say maybe the grasslands as opposed to the rainforest. So um, the model is very flexible. You can change the way it's parameterized so that you can run it in these different systems. Now in the tropics, the big bigger challenge is not necessarily the lack of seasonality, but more so the lack of clear observations. We're dealing with an optical sensor. We saw in that little movie when you've got clouds coming through, they obscure the land surface and we can't get a clear look or a good data point. So when you're working in the tropics, you're dealing with many fewer observations. You may also deal with uh, huge gaps just in years that don't have data uh, due to differences in how uh, different receiving stations around the world were collecting Landsat data. So some tropical countries have data kind of through the whole time series record back to the 80s, the way we have in the continental U.S. Other places I've seen you may be missing, you know, five, six year gaps here and there where there just was no data uh, downlinked from the satellites. So the tropics can be a bit tricky and uh, if you actually check out my, my paper in Remote Sensing and Ecology and Conservation, I do have some examples there of what time series from the tropics look like and a little bit of discussion on challenges and what we might do to get around them. I'm not seeing any more questions at this time. Okay. Um, Give a few minutes if anyone else has any questions about Landsat or time series processing, maybe even our data collection methods. Another one here is shot holing a visible signal. Is what a visible signal? Shot holing. Shot holing. I'm not quite sure what's meant by that. He clarified herbivory. Oh, herbivory. Okay, yeah, so that's actually what we've been looking for. At least, are, like, are we talking her herbivorous insects? Because that's what's going on with the gypsy moth defoliation. Um, so in that case, yes, any changes to the forest canopy are potentially visible. Um, we focused a lot of our early efforts on looking at this gypsy moth outbreak. First of all, it was, it was a very uh, timely topic when we got started on it at the beginning of the summer since everyone was talking about this large gypsy moth outbreak that we hadn't seen in decades. Um, but in any given season, we do see some degree of herbivory. Uh, winter moths are also a topic of interest, so we can see that they defoliate a bit less than gypsy moths. And kind of in the overall signal, we do see at the beginning of the season, actually go back in my slides here, So even if we're not dealing with a, um, a large-scale outbreak or a, a pest like gypsy moth that does really significant defoliation, if we just look at for a deciduous forest the shape of the uh, annual curve, you can see there that the, the early summers so around day of year 150 is much higher than the late summer, say when you're getting into August, September. And that's a function of kind of that 
the damage to leaves that occurs kind of in any given forest canopy, we've got some defoliation or vivary uh, as well as just the leaves aging. And so I guess to summarize, I'd say we, we are seeing the effects of everything from kind of moderate background level defoliation or vivary that we're expecting in any forest canopy all the way through, we're able to detect these massive defoliation events caused by an invasive species like the gypsy moth. Another one here, what methods do you use to detect and remove outliers from time series data? Great question. All right, so um, we have actually two steps to get rid of our bad data points. So I have said a few times that we use all clear observations. So we use um, the FMASC product, which now comes with Landsat imagery. It's on demand for each image in the USGS archive. Um, and the FMASC product uses an object-based approach to find clouds cloud shadows, and snow in any image. So what you end up with is this mask product that has categories for clouds, shadows, snow, clear water, and clear land. And out of that, we will keep any pixels that fall within the clear land and clear water areas for each image. Um, and then once we have all of the kind of pre-mask, F-mask, image-based uh, piece completed, we move into the time series domain. And we use a second masking step. Um, so the FMask algorithm is not perfect. We may miss the edges of clouds, cloud shadows, maybe uh, mistaken for other things. So we are able to then use the kind of multi-temporal view and get rid of uh, outliers in that way. So not to get too technical, but we end up fitting a, a model kind of to the data set and looking for individual points that are either too bright uh, in the green reflectance, which suggests that they're likely a cloud, or they're too dark in the short waves, which suggests they're likely a cl uh, cloud shadow. And so we use this multi-temporal masking process to kind of do the final cleanup on the data set before we analyze. And even then, uh, it's not perfect. So even in the time series that I'm showing on the screen right now, a lot of those points kind of out of the normal um, those ones kind of down in the below zero range especially are likely just mist clouds and cloud shadows. And in that case, our models are uh, designed to be robust enough that one or two data points is not going to significantly change our results um, if they're robust enough to those kind of mist outliers. But yeah, we use this two-step F mask and then multi-temporal masking process to try and clean up as best we can before running any analysis. Have you looked into how leaves coming down in the fall may interrupt ground cover invasives data? No, although that's a, a very interesting connection. I don't think we've discussed yet. Um, so we do have this information on kind of the timing of senescence, and I imagine that if you've got leaves coming down on a, a green understory that that may have some influence. It's definitely something that we, would look, we could look into further. So I guess while we're waiting for other questions, maybe I'll go back to the movie slide and we can watch a little bit more imagery roll by. I have another question here. Is it prohibitively expensive to augment Landsat data with hyperspectral data? Oh, yes, there's a lot of interest in hyperspectral sensors and um, it's some it's an area that I don't have a lot of personal experience uh, dealing with. So I know most of the hyperspectral data I've seen is done on aerial flights, and so that can be that can be very expensive. Um, but I guess a question becomes, what are you trying to get out of the hyperspectral data? Um, since the opening of the archive and being able to use the Landsat temporal domain, we've kind of started to revisit things that we thought were only possible using hyperspectral data. 
but rather than using individual images, using these time series approaches and time series features. So I've done some work, um, I showed the slide with the oak probability mapping or central hardwood probability maps. Um, in that case, a lot of forest species composition work has been done with hyperspectral data. And we've found, not a direct comparison to hyperspectral, but we've found that using features derived from time series, things like in those harmonic models, the annual variability or the intercept, as well as these phenology features, allow us to discriminate between uh, forest types, especially in New England, where we've got a very diverse and complex forest, uh, much better than we could with individual images or multi-date images. And so um, I guess the question for me becomes not necessarily what it takes to integrate the two, but whether we can get at things that we thought we needed hyperspectral data for by using the Landsat spectral temporal domain instead of just the kind of image-based spectral domain. Okay, this would probably be our last question because we have to get ready for our next webinar. Is the resolution of the satellite data expected to improve with future technology enhancements? Okay, so um, the next Landsat satellite is in the process of being built, Landsat 9, and it will be at a 30 meter resolution just like the previous Landsat 8, 7, 4, and 5. Um, though there is talk, a Landsat 10 may have a reduced resolution um, to match the European Space Agency's new series of satellites, the Sentinels. So the Sentinel satellites coming out of the European Space Agency have a 10 meter resolution. They have fewer spectral bands than Landsat, uh, but they have multiple sensors, so they're hoping to get up to a five day repeat time with 10 meter resolution. So by integrating Landsat and Sentinel, we may be able to get some finer estimates uh, using their, their finer spatial resolution. Um, and then also, like I said, looking forward to future missions, we may see reduction in the pixel size uh, which will help with uh, discriminating spatial processes. But no matter what the resolution of the sensors is, it's definitely helpful for everyone who's contributing their on-the-ground data that really helps us do the type of modeling we want to do for invasive species to consider those different resolutions. So keeping track of how big pixels are, what type of sensor you want to relate your data to, um, and making your data available as percent covers and those uh, stem count type estimates. All right, Valerie, thank you very much. I'm going to have to sign off great, now. Thank you. Get, get ready for the next one. All right. Thank you all for your great questions, and be in touch if you've got data or you want to get on our listserv. We would look forward to hearing from you.